I'd like to introduce Denise Morrison to talk about Campbell's success and innovation going forward. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for that introduction. I appreciate it. Yes, I am a Jersey girl. And, um, and I did come from a, um, a very high achieving household. Um, my dad's idea of an outing was going to the library on a Saturday and we'd have to pick out a book and then we had the choice to either give him an oral or a written book report. And he would all the way to the library would say, I remember crossing the Elberon Railroad tracks and he would say, my goodness, it took these people years to write these books and you're gonna get all this knowledge in one week. So um, I have many stories of childhood and I guess you know, some of the things that our parents instill in us and the way we're brought up and the influence of my sisters uh, as my first business partners uh, does affect how you eventually grow up, achieve goals, and lead companies. So um, I'm honored today to be able to share with you some of my perspective on our innovation efforts at Campbell's and just a little peek under the tent of um, being a CEO now for 18 months. So when I, um, when I took uh, the job at Campbell's as CEO, um, I chose to use that opportunity to take the leadership team uh, off campus. And in fact, we were in Princeton, New Jersey, in the bowels of a hotel with no windows. And we literally papered the walls with numbers and trends, et cetera, and really did a deep dive into where, where has our company been, where are we now, and more importantly, where are we going? And it was a, it was a wonderful exercise. It was a bonding moment for the team. But you know, from that, we really did say that, look, at, we have great cash flow, we have great margins, we've got great return on invested capital. Our opportunity at Campbell's is to drive growth. I mean, we, our growth for the past couple years had been sluggish. And so we set up a strategic vision to drive sustainable, profitable net sales growth. And as part of that, we actually came up with a framework and we chose to do a framework rather than a hardcore strategy um, because we thought that by providing the organization with a framework, they could create within that framework and, and new ideas would surface. But we said, first of all, we had to focus on three growth strategies to stabilize and profitably grow our North America soup and simple meal business, which is our largest business, to expand our international presence and finally, to grow faster in healthy beverages and baked snacks. For those of you, uh, we're called the Campbell Soup Company. People sometimes think of us as only soup, but we have healthy beverages with the V8 line. Uh, we've got Prego pasta sauces, Pace Picante. We have Pepperidge Farm. So we do have other businesses that are actually growing pretty fast, and so making sure that we kept that runway. Um, we also identified a number of enabling strategies to build our brand and product equity, deliver meaningful innovation, which is what I'm going to talk more about today to you, grow faster with strategic customers, leverage external development in the broadest sense, not only mergers and acquisitions, but partnerships, particularly in the international space where we don't necessarily have operations today. Um, and while we're executing against those growth enabling strategies, to make sure we're very mindful of our cost and our margin management. And the, the fundamental underpinning of this is to make sure we take a highly engaged organization that we have today and dial that up for higher performance. So the strategic framework was not just a chart on the wall. It actually became um, a moment of inspiration for the whole company and then the leadership team set forth to bring it to life. And I'm gonna share with you some of the outcomes, particularly on the second one in terms of driving meaningful innovation. But first of all, let me set some context because you know we're operating, I don't have to tell you, you're all experiencing it too. We're operating in very challenging times here. You know, when I took this job, it's like timing in life is everything. But I, I think I am the right, 
uh, personality for this time because I love a great challenge and certainly these are challenging times and it's no different for the food industry. In fact, if I look at, at the peers in this industry, I mean the average EBIT growth um, over the last uh, year has been zero. So we're, we're, um, we're in a very slow growth environment, particularly in the U.S. And uh, I think that, that this um, recession has all caused everyone to take a pause and really think about how we're operating and making sure that we're operating with the consumer in mind. Uh, but it's not just the United States. I mean, I don't have to tell you that when you go, we have operations in Europe, and Europe is under some tremendous financial pressure. Uh, we have operations in Australia, and even though that market technically isn't in a recession, the consumer is behaving like it is. And even emerging markets like China, um, are, they're still growing faster than the United States, but that growth rate has slowed. So each, each market has its individual, um, in individual issues, but you know, we realize more and more every day that we are uh, a very interconnected world at this point. Um, so, so really, in this kind of context, what, the, what we've decided at Campbell's is the way to win in this environment is to stay focused on consumers and really be a student of consumer behavior, what they're doing, what they're thinking about. And, um, and, and one of the things that, uh, and uh, Mark had talked about it before, one of the things that we're all over right now is the consumer the way digital is changing the consumers' lives. Uh, it's changing the way they communicate, it's changing the way companies connect to them, it's changing the way we talk to them, market to them, interact with them. And, um, and this is a particularly uh, an important point with the next generation. I, I have a funny story. I was um, in a restaurant in Florida and I, I saw this baby uh, with an iPad, and the baby was actually flipping the screens. It's just remarkable. This, this, you know, if we think this next generation is technically savvy, I mean, the, the, the toys that, that my children played with in the crib are so different than the ones that my children's children will play with. And so, um, in fact, one baby, I saw the, the mom gave the baby a magazine, and the baby tr w couldn't understand why the magazine wouldn't flip the screens. I mean, that's how <laughs> technical they are today. But I, I think digital is, is one area that we have absolutely embraced at Campbell's. And we're not experts at it, but it's, it's evolving, and we, we want to test and learn in that environment. But what we discovered through our work with consumers is that Campbell's has built its business with baby boomers, and we over-index with baby boomers. Uh, and that's wonderful. Baby boomers grew up with Campbell's, and we grew up with them. But this next generation of millennials, the children of baby boomers, is 80 million people. And we index at 85%. It's not zero. So they eat our products, and they have a fondness for our brands. But we have an opportunity with them to build our household penetration and our buying rate with them. And so this was a wonderful discovery. And what we decided was, you know, we really had to understand millennials and, and you know, uh, and so we put, it, we put a, a, a insights team together and literally they went out and they shopped with them, they worked with them, they went to pop-up bars with them and I couldn't get them to come back to Camden. So they had so much fun. And, um, but we really did a deep dive on millennials and their relationship to food and brands, and that has inspired a lot of the innovation that we're putting out to market. The other consumer trend that we have been all over for a while, but we've expanded our perspective on it, has been health and wellness. Because our core baby boomers are aging, and I feel that pain, uh, you definitely have to make sure we're providing consumers with the health and wellness choices that they're thinking. And it's not a silver bullet. You know, it's not a one size fits all. Health and wellness to me is going to be different than health and wellness to somebody else. And so really understanding how consumers define that and what needs and benefits they're looking for is really important. For example, in V8 we provide vegetable nutrition and in our red juice actually vegetable nutrition and lower calories. And um, in, in our health we, we provide 
lower sodium, heart healthy levels of sodium for, for consumers who care about that. And so we've worked very hard at Campbell's to make sure that we have choice in our lines for health and wellness needs for consumers, whether it's uh, freshness or texture or appearance or satiety, and, and making sure that our foods are very convenient because that's also important. Well, this, this uh, deep dive in health and wellness had really led us to the understanding that there is a shift going on in food, and this is an increased demand for fresh foods. And fresh has stronger health cues credentials. And what this did was inspired us to make the largest acquisition that we've made in Campbell's company history. And Campbell's is a 140-year-old company, by the way. Uh, we just acquired Bolthouse Farms. It's a company in California. They make, you can see in the center of the slide, they make a range of super premium juices, uh, very good for your juices. They also have uh, baby carrots. They're one of the largest suppliers of baby carrots, and they are us now. We're one of the largest suppliers of baby carrots. And we think that this also gives us a, um, a platform for packaged fresh food that we can bring Campbell's capabilities to this platform and even make that range bigger. We currently today are a very large player in shelf-stable food found in the center store. And this gives us an opportunity to play bigger in the perimeter of the store and have the best of both. And so this has been a wildly exciting acquisition for us, again, driven by consumer insight. And I think, I think as you look at the landscape, um, the, the key message here is that we are in an era of the shift. I call it the shift. It's a consumer shift. And I've given you a couple examples of some of the insights that we have had paying attention to that. And I sat next to Sam Palisamo, the former CEO of IBM, at a dinner. And I said, Sam, how did IBM know to go from you know, hardware to PCs and PCs to service and then service to big data? When, did you, when were you able to really read those, those moves by the market? and be able to build your company, paying attention to those moves. And he said, Denise, you don't want to miss the shift because it's painful when you do. And IBM missed the first one, and they caught up, but they are never going to miss a shift again, is his, 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 was his proclamation. And so you know, it, it's really important that companies are good at what they do, but companies need to adapt and evolve. And at Campbell's, we've chosen to let the consumer lead us to those places to really understand the shifts that are going on in the market and not approach them with fear, but approach them with courage. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So what we decided at Campbell's is it's really all about new terrain, new platforms, new consumers, new technologies, and new markets while we continue to do what we do best every day. While we continue to satisfy our core consumers, we must venture out into these other areas so that we're a company that does not miss the shift in the industry that we're in, in the world we're in, and in the market, markets we're in. So what we did was we said that we didn't just want to have innovation as a hobby. We wanted innovation to be a new way of working. And what we when we analyzed where we were in innovation, we were great at line extensions, you know, the, new, the next new flavor of chunky soup. That's great. You need to do that. We call that, we now have distinguished that as renovation. You need to bring news to your base business. However, it's really important that some of the R&D resources and some of the marketing resources are looking at what is the more disruptive innovation that you can bring to a category. And so um, we talked about setting a, you know, a, a higher aspiration that we wanted to double the rate of innovation, have the cost, half the time, and have a new structure and a new process for doing so. And I want to share that with you today. Um, we, uh, I took my leadership team 
out to um, Boulder, Colorado to work with Jim Collins, the author of the book Good to Great, Build to Last, and his recent book Great by Choice. And Jim is a, a pretty inspiring guy. He's very data-driven, that's why I like him. Um, and um, he gave us a metaphor that was really quite important. Um, he said, if you're going to be an innovative company, you've got to be comfortable firing a lot of bullets. And then when you get a cannonball, you put your money down. And knowing the difference between the bullet and the cannonball is really important. And that our, our leadership team really liked that, that metaphor. Because at Campbell's, we would spend 18 months developing a new product and then do this major national launch. And it either worked or it didn't. And you've spent a lot of money. Instead of being more of a test and learn, try a few things in a couple markets, try get a read on them along the way, use the internet to get feedback from consumers. This whole idea of you know, spraying the market with some consumer validated ideas, I mean, not reckless, but much, much, with much more speed. You, know, you can't have a new product every 18 months and live in this world. You have to go faster, but you have to not skip the disciplines to do that. So making sure that we're, we were, um, we were uh, actively uh, doing that. The second thing is being open to open innovation. And what I mean by that is, um, is open innovation is where other people also give you input into ideas that you can build upon. You don't have to do everything yourself. So we're in the beginning um, stages of that. And then finally, making sure that we put the consumer at the center of everything we do. But we developed this new process that, um, that, that was, I, I think I define it as game changing. Uh, what I did was I went out to, um, to IDEO, which is an innovation house in Palo Alto, across from Stanford University, ironically. And I observed the way they did innovation. And they, did, um, they had an idea that came in, and they would collect small teams around it. And then um, they finished the project. And then they'd come back to the center and morph to another idea. And it might be a whole different set of people. So I thought that was a really fluid way to think about it. In a big company, when you have big base businesses, you need to make sure innovation becomes a focal point, not a hobby. <laughs> so what we did was we, we pulled a very high potential leader and said, we're going to anoint you as the czar of innovation. And we set up under this leader these cross-functional breakthrough teams that would, would be working in a very disciplined way to find consumer spaces. Um, and it was really interesting, because what it created was like a small company in a big, with big company resources. And, um, and, so, and they were able to um, act like small businesses and um, you stream through a lot of ideas. They had um, consumer insights people in R&D right on the team with marketing and sales. And so it actually turned out to be a very refreshing model. But it was very disciplined and, and systematic in the process that they follow. They have um, drill sites. They really understand the consumer's passion points and pain points so they can create around solutions for that and build innovation solutions that actually delight people. So that, um, that, has, that has been pretty breakthrough for our company. And, um, and so, you know, for example, this particular product, Go Soup, is, um, is, was designed with millennials. And it's, it's out of the can. It's microwavable, 2 minutes 15. It's very easy. You can put it in your briefcase or your purse and, um, and take it to work with you. It was, it was designed with um, recipes that are much, have much more taste adventure. But this is one of the first products that came out of that process. And instead of taking 18 months to get to market, they were able to get this start to finish concept to fi finish product in 12 months, which was you know, a, a real record time for us. And, so, and they're absolutely delicious. So that's an example of these teams at work. Um, but I think that, that one of the discoveries that we made, and we still have work to do on this, because you don't flip a switch and change a company, um, is that we really have to make sure we're evolving our culture to foster and enable innovation. And so 
what we did was we had this framework where we put the consumers right in the center and we say we want to win them. We want to wow them, involve them, and nourish them. And it starts with really understanding the insights, some of the insights that I shared with you this morning, and then really listening to them, okay? Understanding trends, listening to them, interacting with them, dreaming with them. You know, what, what do you want that you don't even know you want yet? Uh, Apple computer has probably been the best at doing that. I mean, now we, we have things like iPads and iPhones and how do we live without them? Um, and then creating. So it's not just having a good idea. It's about how do you operationalize it, commercialize it, and make a business out of it. So um, this, this has been, a, a, again, a discipline that we've been using. Um, and and I, I had a, a leader meeting, and it just kind of, it wasn't going fast enough for me, which patience isn't one of my virtues, but I, I had three, over 300 of my top leaders in a room, and I said, look, what, what's stopping us from going faster on this? What's stopping us from going bigger? And people were literally grabbing the microphone. And they said, you know, we have to take, we have to be less risk averse. We have to be, uh, stop being afraid of making mistakes. We have to stop being afraid of failing. And, um, and we, we talked about what were the fears attached to that. And, um, and, you know, they talked about we have to be better at managing conflict. There's, a, there's actually a healthy tension is important. For, for teams to go through, because healthy tension gets ideas to a bigger place. And then finally, um, we have to be more comfortable with embracing this experimentation that I talked to you about before, and taking calculated risk, all with the highest integrity. And we'd never ask people to do anything out of the lines. Thinking out of the box doesn't have to be thinking out of the lines. And so. Um, so we, um, we came up with the value of courage, and, we, and it's up on the screen here. We have our, we're a very values-driven company, so it's not just the what we do, it's the how we do it is really important to us. And our values are character, competence, and teamwork, and we added the value of courage because we, we wanted to signal very much out loud to the, to the company that we're not going to just expect you to turn on a switch and be innovative. There are behavioral things that we have to change as a company in order to do this and do it really, really well. And so um, that's where that came from. The other thing is we are a company uh, that has a leadership model uh, that guides the leadership behavior of all of our people. And we literally use this in our performance evaluation. So it's not just delivering on your business objectives, but have you been the kind of leader that we believe uh, you should be when you're working for Campbell's, uh, starting with inspiring trust, uh, creating direction. What we did is we added driving decision making to our model and building talent and culture. And with the, in building and talent and culture, it was really about that culture that fosters innovation. Okay, the fun part now. So I talked to you a little bit about Go Soup. And again, this is the, the pouch soup that it just started. It just started shipping this soup season, which starts after Labor Day. Uh, we just turned on the marketing, so it's really too soon to tell. But um, this is a little bit more premium to our canned product, and uh, much. It's a lot more convenient. It's for a different uh, target, but um, we welcome anybody to eat the soup. And it's got um, some some great great recipes, and it's and the packaging is very clever as well. So that, that's one um, that we introduce. The other thing is we're, ma we're making a market with um, skillet sauces. Our insights showed us that the skillet is a very popular way for millennials to cook because it's easy, you know, and we made it easier. Um, you can make chicken marsala now, and this is absolutely delicious and not high in calories. And you, all you do is you cook your chicken in the skillet sauce and put it over noodles or rice. <laughs> and you've got, voila, chicken marsala, and you're a hero. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that the millennials, affectionately known as the potluck generation, love food. And they love to eat food with their friends. They love to take pictures of food and put it on Facebook. And so we're tapping into what we believe is a big behavior. And both of these executions, we don't look at as one-shot deals. These are platforms that we can build upon. And we will, we will do so in the, in the coming 
years. We also have, um, you know, Andy Warhol uh, that was so famous, and there's a wonderful exhibit, by the way, at, at the um, MoMA, but we, uh, we did a special edition cans where we uh, ex brought some excitement to the canned soup business with these limited edition cans or special edition cans. And people sell out, they collect them, they, you can eat the soup too. Um, <laughs> so that, I mean, that's just an example of, of some of the new products that we've, we've put out. Um, we have, as I said, we have a, a platform, so we'll be bringing in other things on top of that platform. We've had um, a lot of innovation in beverage. Once upon a time, there was just a V8 red juice, and that was delivering three full servings of vegetables to consumers. And once you hit 40, you could have had a V8, right? But we wanted to get younger people in the franchise, and so innovation um, several years ago, we, we had a breakthrough where we had uh, the creation of V8 V Fusion, which is a, you get the vegetable nutrition with the fruit taste. And so it's a full serving of fruit and a full serving of vegetables. And, um, and now we've expanded V8 V Fusion into other uh, faster growing segments of the healthy beverage. And you can see up there, we've got um, V8 V Fusion plus tea, we've got a sparkling beverage. The two that are doing the best are V8 Energy, which I don't have today, but we also just introduced a V8 V Fusion uh, kids beverage that can go right in the lunchbox. And this is, um, this is a better for you uh, juice for children that um, children can get their vegetables without, it's a kind of a stealth way for children to get their vegetables. So that's been very, very exciting. Um, the other thing we've done is in our Pepperidge Farm business, we've collaborated with our um, Arnott's business in Australia, and they have a product down there called Shapes, and they have a very great capability in flavor systems. So in Pepperidge Farm, we just introduced Jingos. This happens to be lime and sweet chili. Uh, these are baked, uh, baked snacks, um, lower in calories. They're better for you than the fried, and um, they're very, very tasty. So. We're very excited about uh, some of that innovation. And you know, Pepperidge Farm, of course, the famous goldfish, this gets us into adult savory. And so moving, move, taking capabilities and moving into different markets is all part of innovation. And then, of course, these are some of my favorites, Milano. It's like to die for. And we found a way to create Milano melts, which has like gooey centers inside, and they're just delicious, and Milano slices, which gives you more of a chocolate to cookie ratio. And then what we, we've also, we had an amazing um, introduction. You see the caramel apple pie and pumpkin cheesecake. Pepperidge Farm tried some soft cookies in seasonal form. So pumpkin spice for Halloween, caramel apple for Christmas. Um, we've got new ones coming after that. These things sold out like this. And so the consumer is really you know, looking for some taste adventure. But these cookies are just amazing. And then um, in, in our bread business, um, this was pretty clever. Um, we took our goldfish equity and created goldfish bread. And it actually has a smile in it. So it makes mom smile because they don't have to cut off the crust. It makes kids smile because their sandwich is more fun. So goldfish is big on smiles these days. And the other thing, too, is we've, um, we've taken our Pepperidge Farm swirl bread and been introducing you know, strawberry banana swirl and, um, and, and, some, and pumpkin spice swirl, so different flavors of swirl to make bread more interesting and, and even bringing bread into snacking. Or the morning occasion, I have my one piece of Pepperidge Farm cinnamon raisin bread, 80 calories every morning. And then, of course, Goldfish is a mega brand. And keeping and Goldfish really stands for children's optimism and self-confidence. And Finn and Friends have been uh, part of their, the fiber of their lives. And we continue to create Goldfish with like Goldfish grams and flavor-blasted Goldfish uh, for older. I talked to you about the Goldfish bread. And one of the things that we're doing, uh, which is very clever, this is very new for us, but um, this is customization, where we put happy birthday Alex on the front of the, of the carton. This is all done through the in internet. And um, the, 
you, you sent a birthday kit for Alex and all these little uh, party fa flavor favors with goldfish in them. And so you can literally have a goldfish birthday party that's customized for your child or your grandchild and um, with pictures of maybe friends or siblings on the back or whatever. So that's been very popular. Um, we're in the infancy stages. We're testing and learning on customization, but uh, so far um, people have really gravitated to that as a really uh, good idea. So we believe at Campbell's we have the right framework. We have to execute it the right way, but done the right way, we believe that this is going to change the growth trajectory of our company. Remember, we're all about now driving sustainable, profitable net sales growth. I didn't talk to you about the international plans that we have because I really wanted to focus on the innovation today. But continue to watch us. Um, hopefully, continue to support us and try our products and give us feedback. But we believe it, it will be worth the wait. And uh, Cam the C people at Campbell's are very energized and very excited about our business. Again, we're a 140-year-old company, but our future is bright. So thank you very much for your attention this morning. And <laughs>